Uh, do you have any uh, new kids on the block from when they tried to reposition themselves as gangster rappers and called themselves NKOTB? Yeah, left them to the back. Thanks. Now, if you were a primary school teacher and you turned up to work drunk and stoned off your head and pointed a gun at everyone, chances are you'd be in trouble. However, if you're a rock star and you do exactly the same thing, you're a legend. How unfair is that? Snoop Dogg and Tupac get in trouble for living fast and loose with their Smith and Wessons, and they're heroes. Yet one nun pistol whips one girl and suddenly everyone's down on the Catholic school system. Now some notable inclusions in the Rock and Roll Firearm Chargers Hall of Fame are blues legend Lead Belly, who killed a man in a barroom brawl in Texas. Jerry Lee Lewis, who shot his bass player in the chest with a pistol. Country singer George Jones, who fired a gun at a Bible basher. James Brown, who broke into an insurance salesman seminar and waved a weapon. Harry Connick Jr., who tried to get past airport security with a firearm. Eddie Van Halen, who did the same. Plus, pretty much every rapper ever, including, but not limited to, Coolio, Buster Rhymes, Bushwick Bill, Old Dirty Bastard, Ghostface Killer, Queen Latifah, P Diddy, Jay-Z, DMX, and Mystical. You can argue with me, but you can't argue with those statistics. Guns and music make a winning combination. In fact, if you're in an up-and-coming band, it's clear you need to be typing Colt 45 plus bullets plus postage and handling into Google and ordering a weapon off the internet. One of the recent inductees to the Rock and Roll Gun Club is Eminem. He pulled a 9mm semi-automatic in a Michigan parking lot. A year later, he pleaded no contest in an Oakland court. Judge Denise Langford sentenced him to one year's probation and told him to submit to the court ideas for community service, stressing that they had to be impactful to young people. Marshall, it's time to read the children a story, yeah? Cleaning the paintbrushes! No, not green eggs and ham! I hate that book! Don't make me call your probation officer, Marshal. God damn it! I saw this one shit on the 
Hoosville News last week that made me sick. A little red car with a star hit a bridge in a ridge with a clunk. I found a fox in socks in the back in a box in the trunk. The guy left some tongue twisters, but they didn't say who it was to. Oh man, Sam I am. Damn. doing science in year 10 and I stopped listening about halfway through year 8, which means when it comes to anything involving biology, I'm not your man. For example, I honestly have no idea whether occasionally taking ecstasy is really bad or not really bad for you. I just don't know. Ask your teacher. Read your funkin' wagnalls. Do what you want. Pop pills every weekend. Don't pop pills ever. Inject speed into your eyeballs. Turn your bedroom into a crack house. I don't care. Just don't blame me. However, even though I never had no fancy science education or nothing, I do know that this isn't a drug. It's a glue stick. And it probably isn't bad for you unless you stick it too far into your ear. But alas, the glue stick has been tainted by its association to dance music, rave culture, and thus in many people's minds, ecstasy. So much so that in 2001, in a curious blip in American legal history, their federal government's drug enforcement agency tried to ban the possession of glue sticks. I spoke to Graham Boyd, the lawyer from the American Civil Liberties Union, who stood up in court for the right of every glow stick to glow. So the Drug Enforcement Agency tried to define glow sticks as drug paraphernalia. How did, how did they come to that conclusion? There's a legal definition in US law for drug paraphernalia, and it's basically any item that's used in order to ingest or prepare drugs. So for instance, a pipe through which you smoked crack would be drug paraphernalia. So under that definition, how would a glow stick be drug paraphernalia? Yeah, a glow stick is, is, is clearly not drug paraphernalia. It, it's really much, in my view, akin to a tie-dye t-shirt or maybe to a lava lamp. It's something that could be culturally associated with drug use. So, so what politicians got together to pass a law that made glow sticks bad? The federal government was actually somewhat clever about this. Um, instead of directly banning these objects, pacifiers, glow sticks and the like, what they did was threaten a individual who ran the facility, the, the manager of the venue, with very harsh criminal prosecution up to a life in prison. And so it didn't really look on its face like a government ban. It looked like a private party uh, banning these items. But at the end of the day, I think the judge understood exactly what was going on. The government was uh, ordered that they could not ban these items and they could not cause any private person to ban the items either. But Graham's not the only one to be caught in the crossfire. Even innocent little me found myself in the middle of the drug dance culture war. This is Talkback Wonder Steve Price. When I first encountered him, he was king of Melbourne radio on top rating station 3AW. 16 degrees, a lot of things I say seem to be controversial, I'm not sure why. I just say things the way they are. He'd been running a lengthy campaign trying to have dance parties shut down, both on his radio show and in his Herald Sun newspaper column. We're going to lose a generation of kids who are going to end up paranoid and waste their lives because they wanted to go out and dance all night and pop tablets. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Unfortunately, on a community radio station, 3 Triple R, in a throwaway comment, I made light of his campaign. If there's any ecstasy manufacturers out there, you know how they always have to put like a logo on so you know all the kids can talk about it, hey, do you have a Mitsubishi or whatever? Can someone do one where they have a 3AW stamp on it? And what about just a Steve Price? A Steve Price. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Angry Dwarf. That's what it'd be called. It'd be called the Angry Dwarf. Yeah. That very afternoon, Steve Price struck back. John Saffron from Triple R suggested they make an ecstasy tablet with a 3AW logo on it. Well, I mean, that's real smart. I couldn't give a stuff about the personal insults. Dwarf doesn't worry me. I'm angry, yeah, I'm angry because you would think even a bunch of community station tryhards might think for taking the ecstasy issue so lightly. 
The longer the show went on, the more paranoid Steve Price became that some backyard amphetamine operation was actually going to press up 3AW ecstasy tablets. So have you ever thought of anybody sitting back and saying, well, John Saffron jokes on Triple R, so maybe it's something that I should try? Please, no one try that dumb idea. Despite Steve Price's prediction, he was left wanting, when no angry dwarves were pressed up by anyone anywhere. Thus, I felt it was my obligation to actualise his fantasy just so he wasn't disappointed. We went to a model maker and got some Angry Dwarf ecstasy tablets made up out of paracetamol. This is Drive with Steve Price until 6. Good afternoon, 96 96 12 78 is the number. Give us a call between now and 6 o'clock. Christine in Collingwood, thank you for hanging on. That's OK, Steve. Look, I just wanted to tell you about the fact that I was at a party on the weekend on Saturday night and someone offered me um, an ecstasy tablet... Um, I don't normally take drugs, but they offered it to me and it had the 3AW logo stamped right in the middle of it. <laughs> we what? finally found one, have we? Found... I'll, I'll tell you how this all came about. In, have you ever heard of that idiot John Saffron who was on uh, that ABC show Race Around the World? I remember the show. I don't know who John Saffron is. He then went rifling through Ray Martin's rubbish bin. Uh, uh, right. I had a blue with him about uh, designer drugs and ecstasy and on his radio program on some community station... They had someone ring up and suggest, or they suggested that they should start producing ecstasy tablets with our logo on. You're kidding. No. Just, just to stick it up me. And we haven't been able to find one since, up until now, but you tell me they're out there. Well, I saw one. I couldn't believe it. That's why I rang in. I never usually, you know, ring in and then I saw them and I just, I thought it must have been a joke or I don't know. Well, Christine, I'm pleased you didn't, you're not an ecstasy user. No, no. You get offered one again, buy one, uh, and I'll fix you up for the money. I'd love to see it. You want to see one? All right. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. This is Drive with Steve Price until 6. Go to Wes in Albert Park. Hello, Wes. G'day. Steve, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, Steve, look, my flatmate's got some of those um, E's that that's, uh, we all saw them before. With, with the AW logo on it? Uh, yep. My flatmate calls them um, Angry Dwarfs, actually but they've got the 3AW logo on them. How long have they been selling them with, with our logo on it? I've got no idea. I, I, um, I don't actually uh, know much about them. I just know he, he was at a club on Sunday night and, and he's got some now in a, uh, a drawer. But look, I'd like uh, to show you, show you yeah, one of them because um, I don't really like having them around the flat, to be honest. No, I don't like having our logo on them either. I'd love to see it, Wes. If you wouldn't mind, I'll uh, obviously keep it completely confidential. I'd just like to, to cite one. I won't buy one, but I'd like to cite one, so. Can someone just come out the front? Because I'm only not far. Can someone come out the front so I don't have to come in? Yep, that's not a problem. Put, go on, we'll just go back to the producer there and we'll get someone down to come downstairs and have a look. Thank you. Someone from the newsroom to go and uh, just verify what uh, Wes is saying. Jack in Essendon, hello. This is Drive with Steve Price until six. Thank you, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Let's go to Gemma in Dandenong, hello. Hi, um, I just wanted to call up to say that I think it's good that you're putting your logo on, on ecstasy tablets. I'm not putting my logo on ecstasy oh, tablets. That... An ecstasy producer is doing it at the suggestion of John Saffron. It's got a Beryl in Moorabbin. Hello, Beryl. Oh, Steve, is that you? Yeah, it's me. Oh, look, I mean... I'm here. Uh, well, Steve, you know, if you're stamping your logo all over drugs, what is... We're not sort of... doing it. What? Well, well, if it has your logo on it, Steve, then I don't know how you can say that you're not doing it. Well, of course we're not doing it. The ecstasy manufacturers are doing it. Do you um, know anything about ecstasy at all? Well, I know what I read in the paper. Every Steve, ecstasy... But you're quite an expert on ecstasy, from what I understand. Well, I've never touched it, never tried it, spent months on this program campaigning against its use. What happens is the manufacturers of ecstasy, on any ecstasy tablet, brand them with a logo. Some of them have Mercedes-Benz on it. Some really of them have need... Ford Motor Company. Well, Some um... of them have McDonald's. Are you suggesting those companies are making ecstasy? Well, are you Steve, seriously like on the phone much. suggesting that we're making and selling ecstasy? Well, it sounds to me very much like that's what you're doing, Well, Steve. you're a complete if multi- deal, if that's the case. Oh, well, I don't think that's very nice calling me a deal. Well, you must be a moron if you think that... You must be a moron if you think we're making ecstasy. Well... Why, why not? I mean, ecstasy makes a lot of money, from what I understand. Well, so you think 3AW is, is working as drug dealers, do you? Well, I didn't say that, Steve. You did, but you... May well have let the cat right out of the bag. Oh, you stupid bitch. This is Drive with Steve Price.
It's time for your say on Voteline. Do you, like Beryl, disagree with 3AW's practice of manufacturing and selling ecstasy to children? Or do you agree with 3AW's progressive attitude and think it's the police, anti-drug campaigners and the church who are out of touch on the ecstasy issue? Go to musicjamboree.com and vote now. He knows the inner secrets of the music industry, but for fear of retribution, he must hide his identity. He is the music mole. Now, Mr. Mole, I believe Rupert Murdoch was a little upset with ex-mushroom record head honcho Michael Gadinsky. That's right, John. In the late 90s, Gadinsky sold Mushroom to Murdoch for over $40 million. Now, one of the jewels in the crown of Mushroom was a licensing arrangement it had with an American company called Zomba. And uh, who, who's Zomba? Well, Zomba's the outfit that puts out Britney Spears, Backstreet Boys, Sync, and a heap of other huge acts. And, and what does it mean that Mushroom had a licensing deal with Zomba? Well, it meant that Mushroom got to be the Australian company that sold Britney Spears and Backstreet Boys albums. And this is where the problem started. Because unbeknownst to Murdoch, when he handed over his $40 million, the licensing arrangement with Zomba was about to expire, and when it did expire, Zomba didn't renew the deal. So Rupert Murdoch was left without Britney Spears, NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys, and presumably this was a big part of why he was willing to fork out over $40 million. That's right, John. So who did Zomba sign with, if not with Mushroom? Well, they didn't sign with anybody. They opened an Australian branch and distributed the records themselves. Anyway, Rupert took Zomba to court. And what happened there? Well, they reached a settlement where both Murdoch and Zomba agreed to share in the Australian distribution rights of all Zomba records. Well, if Zomba Records are happy and Rupert Murdoch's happy, then I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Mould. My pleasure, John. When I was young, we never had none of this fancy Kyle and Jackie O on the Hot 30 countdown. No, back in my day, we had to make do with Casey Kasem's American Top 40 on a crystal set made out of old German bomb parts. OK, it was just a normal goddamn stereo, but I never had no fancy mega bass. Anyway, my favourite part of the Casey Kasem American Top 40 was the long distance dedication, where the person with the most tragic hard luck story got to request a song for a loved one who was inevitably either A, missing, possibly still in a Viet Cong prisoner of war camp, or B, dead, and they never had a chance to tell them just how much they loved them. Then Casey would cue Foreigner, or if we're lucky, Ario Speedwagon. And my favourite genre of the long distance dedication was the dedication to the band from the family of the boy in the coma who was roused from the coma by the song by the band. What an incredible claim. Some kid's in a coma. Doctors can't do anything. Drugs can't do anything. Yet Mike and the mechanics can. When I used to hear these long distance dedications, I used to think to myself, is this true, or is this just some bucket-bong-smoking college kids trying to pull one over Casey Kasem? I spoke to Dr Stephen Grossman, whose brain trauma unit in Fresno, California, specialises in using music therapy on comatose patients. So Casey Kasem's right, you can wake people from comas using music. Uh, when they wake up, it's not a magical, I'm asleep, like in the movies, and then boom, I'm awake and talking and I walk out of the hospital. When these patients awaken, the first thing we see is fluttering of their eyelids. They might start moving a finger or toe. So, so how does the music wake you up? The thought is that if we can get information in and stimulate parts of the brain, that parts of the brain will recruit from other parts of the brain. And, and actually, an injured brain can regain use. The, the resonance that you hear of this, again, as we do something like this, is, is it just a simple uh, vibration. But if I do it in the wrong way, I may not get the, the vibration. You have to do it just the right way. we got to figure out what song will do that to the water in the brain. So what's the best sort of music to use? We want to use something that's in there, and we don't always know what it is. So we need to go with the long-term memory. We need to do an extensive music history on them, their family, what CDs they have at home. We bring their CDs in and watch their facial grimacing, watch the blood pressure, the heart rate, to see what happens when the music comes on. So, Dr. Grossman, based on your years of experience, what's your top five? Five! The Stones, you can't always get what you want. We just recently played this to a gentleman, and he started crying. Four! Out of Africa, those in the age group 40 on up, Out of Africa was wonderful. 
three. And Queen is a great one. We will rock you, and it's a constant beat droning on. You know, we will, we will rock you. Two. We had a person in the airline industry. His favorite was Elton John, Rocket Man, and Benny and the Gifts. One. Neil Young, number one. Needle and Damage Done uh, has worked really nicely. If you're in a coma, you want him. Good at the evidence, but what precautions are you taking? Do you really want your parents fumbling through your CD collection, trying to remember whether it was Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little Pill or Jagged Edges, Jagged Little Thrill that you're really into? But now, there's a quick and easy solution. Go to musicdambury.com and open up our wallet-sized Wake Me From A Coma medical card. Type in your desired song. Print it out. Cut it out. Then go down to your local video shop and get the guy behind the counter to laminate it for you. Pop it in your wallet. Now you can carry on your day safe in the knowledge that if the worst does happen, you won't have to spend the rest of your life in an oxygen tent listening to Usher or some shit. Indonesia, our neighbours to the north. There are 6,964 kilometres of railway tracks, according to the SBS World Guide, and a rich music history that goes on even longer. Dr Jordania. Yeah, the gamelan is uh, the most important uh, musical phenomenon in the, uh, Indonesia. It's actually orchestra, which consists of the gongs and different types of percussions. It has a very distinct uh, tingling uh, sound. It's mostly connected to the Buddhist tradition. Uh, traditionally, actually, only the men are allowed to play gamelan, although, for instance, uh, there is at least one orchestra in Java which, which consists only of women. There are other elements of respect. For instance, you can't go there uh, with your shoes on. You should be barefoot going there. Thank you, Dr Jordania. Thank you. And now to demonstrate the gamelan, we have Magic Dirt with Dirty Jeans. Legs are aching, my eyes is so. Have 
That's the 